no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help you prepare for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon if you can. We appreciate you. Advances in rocket science might seem to happen overnight, but the technology behind today's amazing space systems almost always started decades ago with basic research. Basic research is different from corporate research. Basic research is almost always funded by national governments, as it does not immediately return any profit. Some of this research has the most profound effects on our society down the road. In 1990, the United States started the Human Genome Project, with the goal of reading all three billion base pairs in the human nuclear genome within 15 years. Funding from the United States National Institutes of Health started the project with support from the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Japan, and China. Thirteen years later, they had accomplished their mission, and along the way, dramatically improved gene sequencing technology. Today at the Mayo Clinic in the United States, using ultra-rapid genome sequencing technology, babies in the neonatal intensive care unit who have mysterious symptoms, like uncontrolled seizures, can have their entire nuclear genome read within eight hours, allowing identification and treatment of rare disorders. This same principle applies to space science. In the 1990s, NASA wanted to make aerospike engines. Aerospike engines are the most efficient nozzle system possible. Unlike bell nozzles, that are only efficient at one specific altitude, aerospike engines are efficient from sea level to the vacuum of space. But aerospikes had an important problem. Heat. Metals like Inconel, used in many rocket engines, are very heat resistant. And most modern rocket engines use active cooling to carry away excess thermal energy, transferring it to the fuel and sending it out through the engine. But these rocket engines are limited by how fast thermal energy can pass through the metal and into the cooling liquid. This is called heat conductance. Let's look now at how NASA solved this problem. NASA identified these problems and decided to address them at the root. NASA is at its best when it helps create innovative technologies that universities and industry can use to create what had been thought impossible. To solve the first problem, NASA decided to fund the development of new alloys. Copper is the best metal to conduct heat without melting, but copper is not very strong. Iron is also not very strong, but if we add chromium to iron, it becomes stainless steel. Stainless steel is strong and corrosion resistant, but compared to copper, it does not conduct heat well. Alloys of nickel, particularly nickel chrome alloys, can withstand tremendous heat, even in the presence of oxygen. One of these is called Inconel, and we saw it used to build the X-15. And it's used in most modern rocket engines, including the Merlin and Raptor. But Inconel also doesn't conduct heat well. NASA decided to take the knowledge we had learned making stainless steel in Inconel and apply it to copper. NASA provided funding to the Glenn Research Center, where they started working on alloys of copper. Copper is an amazing metal and conducts heat better than almost anything else. Believe it or not, silver is actually better, but it has more mass and would be a little pricey. Copper is often used to line rocket engine components but copper is not a very strong metal. Remember watching it burn away in this Raptor when the oxygen fraction got too high? So they needed the heat conduction of copper with greater strength. The Glenn Research Center started studying different alloys of copper, combining it with a variety of elements. Chromium of at least 10% makes iron into stainless steel. The metallurgists thought this was too high and would reduce the heat conductance. So they started by adding chromium at 8% by atomic mass. It turns out, however, that welding or sintering metals can cause unwanted byproducts to occur and weaken the metal. 
Niobium is added to steel, so it will not weaken when welded or melted. The scientists added 4% by atomic mass niobium to produce an alloy that would be an optimized solution for high-performance engine systems and would satisfy the need for high conductivity to dissipate heat and decrease the wall temperature to acceptable levels. This was called GRCOP84. GRC is for Glenn Research Center, copper is obvious, and the numbers show the percent by atomic mass of chromium and niobium that they started with. And just to be thorough, they cut those amounts in half, also creating GRCOP42. These alloys were ordered and tested. Here you see the thermal conductivity chart from the NASA study. Both performed better than anything else available. Here you see the thermal stress versus life cycle and the mechanical strain. Both these alloys had similar yield and tensile strength under thermal stress, but GRCOP42 turned out to be the most promising at very high temperatures. Then they were evaluated for another characteristic. NASA needed an alloy that worked well in powder form, so it could be used in additive manufacturing, what most of us call 3D printing. 3D printing is the only way to make intricate internal cooling channels while maintaining strength. Japan conceived and started 3D printing technology at the Nagoya Municipal Industrial Research Institute. Dr. Hideo Kodama, in May of 1981, published the details and called it rapid prototyping. He didn't bother to patent the technology, and innovators all over the world started using the technology, at first just using wax or plastic, but very quickly learning how to print with metal. They opened up the possibility of printing a metal device that would be impossible to make with traditional methods. There are several ways to 3D print metal. 3D printing metal is not easy. Relativity Aerospace uses wire-fed robots, and this works well for many alloys. Metal powder 3D printers were created. Here you see one working. A layer of powder is set down, and the laser fuses the metal particles into a design. The platform drops down a fraction, and another layer of powder is spread. This is a side view of how these machines work. Once the next layer is centered, more powder is spread and scraped away. Here is a selective laser melting 3D printer schematic. This is just one type of additive manufacturing technology. There is also something called directed energy deposition, and here is how that works. Powder is sent down to this print head, where electricity is applied through the head as a resistor to heat and melt the powder. The molten alloy can then be used to print a complex 3D design. In this process, the print head moves, and so does the base if necessary. I still believe that 3D printing is the future of space manufacturing, and a technique called cold spray additive manufacturing also exists. Both of these can use GRCOP42 to literally paint alloys into or onto parts. In this way, titanium, nickel, and other alloys can be used, including something as heat conductive as copper alloys. A cold spray or directed energy deposition device could be used to put a layer of copper alloy inside your combustion chamber after it was printed in one piece of titanium or inconel. Here you see the powder chemistry comparison of the two test alloys, as they were able to produce a printable powder. We see that the chromium content is actually less than had been estimated at the start, as is the niobium. Iron can adulterate the chromium and must be limited. Oxygen adulterates the niobium and must also be limited. Aluminum and silicone must be kept down as contaminants. The characteristics sought included establishing a supply chain, making the powder scalable for selective laser melting printers, defining the microstructural sensitivities related to printing, and finally, disseminating the data to industry and print vendors. NASA performed prints to make sure that these powders would work for combustion chambers. This practical application of the new copper alloy powder allowed them to lay out these helpful instructions. These powders must be atomized with argon gas. Nitrogen will not work as nitride will form. The powder must be in an inert gas or vacuum at all times. Exposure to the air will contaminate it with oxygen. It can be stored in glass or aluminum, but not plastic. They specified the purity of the constituent metals. 99.5% for niobium, 99.8% for chromium, and 99.99% for the copper. 
Now that we know how to make and use these unique alloys, how are they applied to combustion chambers? Here we see what is called a slip jacket channel cooled combustion chamber. The nozzle would go down here. The copper liner could be printed and inserted into this steel, titanium, or inconel jacket. Here are liners printed from the copper alloy, and here is a test being conducted on one of them. Here we see a long duration test result of a GR COP 42 liner. Here we see the nozzle inlet temperature, outlet temperature, chamber pressure in Imperial, and nozzle outlet pressure. This looks pretty stable to me. Then they test the system with rapid power cycling, firing the engine in bursts. We see that the alloy performed well here also. A visual inspection of the interior of these liners shows that they stood up very well to these tests. Finally, they printed and tested larger liners and released their results to the world. After the invention of GR COP42, NASA lost its funding for its aerospike goals. But that basic research allowed a company in Spain called Pangea Aerospace to make the world's first functional aerospike engine, described in this lesson. These engines are now being made available in the 300 kilonewton thrust range. Aerospike engines can not only survive much higher combustion chamber temperatures, but they can use the heat harvested by the cooling system to power expander cycle turbo pumps preventing the need to burn fuel and oxidizer in a pre-burner, creating engines more efficient than the Raptor or BE-4. And as we strive to increase the efficiency of rocket engines, we come to another technology, detonation rocket engines. A detonation rocket engine is a type of propulsion system that uses the principle of detonation to generate thrust. Unlike traditional rocket engines, which use a steady combustion pressure to produce thrust, Detonation engines rely on a rapid and violent chemical reaction that occurs when fuel and oxidizer mixtures are detonated. The engine takes in a mixture of fuel and oxidizer, which is then compressed to a high pressure using a series of pumps or compressors. This helps to increase the reactivity of the mixture. The compressed mixture is then ignited in a detonation chamber using a spark or other ignition source. The ignition causes a rapid and violent chemical reaction to occur, creating a supersonic shock wave that propagates through the mixture. The shock wave compresses and heats the mixture ahead of it, causing it to undergo further combustion and releasing a large amount of energy in the form of heat and pressure. This supersonic shock wave results in the expansion of the combustion products, creating a thrust that propels the rocket forward. All rocket engines are limited by two things, the velocity of the exhaust and the mass propellant flow through the engine. Detonation rocket engines have the potential to be more efficient and powerful than traditional rocket engines. But the sudden increase in temperature and pressure can be very destructive. The detonation must be controlled to be useful. Chemical rocket engines, on the other hand, work by regular combustion, which is a subsonic process. A fuel and oxidizer are burned in a combustion chamber, creating a high pressure and temperature. An outlet for the hot pressurized gas is created, forming a converging diverging nozzle for classic De Laval rocket engines, or through a ring or linear throat in an aerospike rocket engine. The gas goes from subsonic to sonic to supersonic. But a detonation rocket engine, where the gas is immediately accelerated to supersonic velocities by the advancing shock wave, would be much more efficient. The problem, again, is that detonations are very destructive. We usually try to avoid them in rocket engines, as they tend to blow the engine apart. A rapid sequence of controlled small explosions can be created in a pulsed detonation rocket engine, but these require long pipes to allow shockwave propagation. A better solution would be something called a rotating detonation rocket engine. This is where the shockwave is supposed to circle around the chamber. The main problem with this is trying to inject the gases at just the right time. Otherwise, the shock wave can double back and cancel itself out. One of the problems with detonation engines is getting the timing just right. You need to inject the fuel and oxidizer when the pressure is low, otherwise you can interrupt shock wave propagation. But this entire system is chaotic, meaning it can't really be predicted. How can you know exactly where the shock wave is? And that brings us back to the amazing engineers at NASA, who, having a good knowledge of ingenious work from the past, 
came up with a unique solution based on the work of this eccentric genius. Nikola Tesla is responsible for so much of the technology in our world today, more than any other single human being. Included in the hundreds of original ideas he had was what we call a Tesla valve. A Tesla valve has no moving parts. Instead, it uses naturally generated vortices to block flow in one direction, allowing a fluid to flow freely in the other direction. An instantaneous valve with no moving parts. This concept was adapted by NASA, as you see here. When the high-pressure shock wave passes over the valve, flow through the valve is obstructed by the vortices and the shock wave passes on. When the low-pressure area behind the shock wave passes over the Tesla valve, fresh oxidizer and fuel gas can flow freely into the engine to be combusted when the shock wave comes around again. This allowed the creation of a stable rotating detonation engine which you see here, that fired continuously for 10 minutes. But once we have our rotating detonation engine, we still need to deal with the heat buildup. And NASA called on the expertise of a company called Velo 3D. I'll let them tell you their contribution. In spaceflight, one of the major challenges has always been increasing propulsion. One of the ways that we can do that is by increasing temperatures and pressures inside the thruster or combustion sections of the engine. But how far can we go with this approach? At some point, you exceed the melting point of your engine. That is why new designs and new alloys are critical to our ability to master space. We work with companies that constantly look for ways to innovate. To push the boundaries of propulsion technology, they regularly bring us their manufacturing challenges. These can be geometric or material challenges. The latest one we've overcome is the ability to print copper. More specifically, GRCOP42. GRCOP42 is a copper, chromium, niobium alloy. Ideal for propulsion applications thanks to its high strength and high conductivity. Velo 3D customers can use the new material to produce mission-critical parts with oxidation resistance and high creep strength at temperatures as high as 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Work on copper-chromium-niobium alloys began under the NASA CSTI Earth to Orbit Propulsion and NASA Graduate Fellowship programs in the late 1980s. From this study, NASA engineers selected GRCOP42 as one of two alloys for future development. The alloy was created after research teams identified ways to make improvements to another copper-based alloy. GRCOP42 can achieve higher thermal conductivity compared to its predecessor, while achieving similar strength properties. The material is ideal for additive manufacturing use cases. One of the challenges that we faced qualifying GRCOP was related to its high thermal conductivity and high melt point. In laser powder bed fusion, we use lasers to melt and consolidate powder material into a final geometry. What we noticed with this copper is that it took more energy to melt and the heat dissipated faster. That means that we needed to rethink many of our process parameters to get the material properties that our customers demand. We're excited to add GRCOP42 to our growing list of qualified materials. Now that you know how the amazing NASA-developed alloy GRCOP42 was invented, making aerospike engines possible, and how the Tesla valve allowed NASA to create a stable rotating detonation engine, we can see these technologies combined in a rotating detonation aerospike engine. The combination of these technologies will make advanced space systems possible that could have never been accomplished with the old technology of the Raptor and BE-4 engines. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.